Okay, good morning, every everyone. Uh, so how are you guys doing? Still staying safe and uh, and happy? So I hope we are getting more used to this uh, remote teaching mode uh, and feeling comfortable with it. So today uh, we are going to uh, continue to cover complex distributions. If you recall, uh, last two lectures we covered uh, uh, distribution over functions, which is a Gaussian process. And then we discussed uh, a distribution over sets, which is the determinantal point process. And uh, today and the next, we are going to discuss uh, distributions over, uh, over distributions, in fact, and also distributions over distributions of features. Okay? So these are very useful tools to further enhance the graphic model to do really fancy stuff and sometimes in a very, very flexible computationally and also modeling wise fashion. And also these tools are really uh, uh, composable and uh, integrable with uh, existing methods such as deep neural networks and other tools. So you build them as a building block for the larger task. All right, so let's begin by, uh, you know, a uh, classical problem uh, to motivate uh, this new technique. Okay. So we all know the problem of uh, clustering. So here I show you the data points spread in uh, two-dimensional space and I want you to cluster it. Right. So what are the you know, usual macro algorithms you will be using? Well, you can type or you can shout out. Okay, without seeing it, I will just name it to you. I guess you will be thinking about a k-means method maybe, and maybe a mixture model, mixture of Gaussian with EM, right? Things like that. And uh, I remember, you know, whenever we give a lecture along these topics, people will ask how to set the K, you know, how many clusters, you know, to do, right? So here it is very obvious because the data points are on, you know, two-dimensional data, you can kind of take a look and uh, then you pick, uh, you know, three, something like that. Yeah. But uh, what if uh, the data are just uh, too high dimensional, you don't see it, right? So then, how do we guess the right number of clusters? That's actually a very interesting topic. And also, what if the data is a streaming data that is, uh, you know, uh, coming, keep coming and changing, and both in volume and also, you know, in you know, in distribution. For example, here you probably can see that the cluster numbers are changing from uh, three in here, and maybe. I don't know, four to here and so forth. So how to let the number of clusters to be flexible? Right? So this is the typical question that has been bothered the machine learners, modelers for a long time. Uh, there are a number of heuristics, right? So one of the heuristic is what? Someone want to shout out? There is a heuristic for you to figure out maybe the best number of clusters. You want to type or you want to shout out? Okay, uh, <laughs> plot K over a uh, square distance, BIC. Yeah, these are, yeah, these are nice ideas. In a sense, you know, uh, you either use a, uh, a penalty function to let uh, the model pay a cost of the complexity, you know, of the model with an increasing number of clusters versus the fitness, or you kind of uh, implicitly already, uh, uh, what the K of square of distances is, is a little vague. It's about, it's on testing or training, right? That's another question. I guess one thing you can think about is cross validation. You just, uh, you know, uh, basically, yeah, try different Ks. And uh, yeah, you, you can, in fact, it's very similar to cross validation, you know, plot basically, you know, uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, quality measure, like the square distances. And then maybe you pick a K, which uh, gives you the best answer, something like that. Good. But again, you need to try many cases, and you may try from one to infinity and, uh, and then, you know, you get one of them, which is very expensive. So that's the problem that is motivating us to study the topic today, right? So here I have a cluster data. 
And how to model? Well, let's say we use our old friend mixture of Gaussian. And here is how do you catch it right down the likelihood function of the mixture of Gaussian. By the way, here it should be n rather than infinity. We have n points. You pick a capital K and then you write down a mixture of uh, you know, Gaussian components. And uh, it's a parametric model, basically assuming a finite number of parameters, right? And uh, you can also you know, uh, apply you know, a Bayesian approach to define the prior distributions of uh, the parameters like this, which is the weight of uh, every cluster. And also like uh, this and that, which are the centroids and the covariance of uh, every Gaussian components, right? And then you define the prior for each of that. That gives you a parametric finite mixture model, Bayesian mixture model, okay? And typically, you know, to make the computation more easy and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in close form, you can use uh, conjugate priors. And here, you know, uh, you know, in fact, the graphic model make it very explicit. You know, all these uh, parameters pi, the theta is basically a, a tuple of uh, mu and uh, sigma, you know, over k such, uh, uh, you know, tuples. And then you define here, you know, a, uh, say a Dirichlet prior, you know, over the weights. And uh, here you use a Gaussian and inverse weight chart to uh, define the priors for both the mean and also the covariance matrix. And you know what is, uh, what does the conjugate prior mean? And we're going to see the effect of that very soon. So I already said this prior is better to be, you know, a uh, Dirichlet process. Let's see why that's the case. So this is how a Dirichlet distribution look like, right? It is uh, parameterized by a k-dimensional vector called an alpha, one to k. And uh, there are some constraints on you know, uh, how the alpha should look like. They should each be non-negative, right? And they should have at least one non-zero component so that the sum will be bigger than zero. And then here is uh, basically the expression of that uh, distribution, okay? Which takes the form of uh, exponential, you know, the, the weight raised to the power defined by the alphas minus one. And then, you know, you can sample a vector from the distribution. And uh, these vectors have a nice property, which is that uh, they each is uh, a, uh, you know, uh, you know, a positive uh, number. Uh, and they all sum to one. Therefore, uh, we call them to be living in a space called a simplex. And this is actually how uh, a three-dimensional, a two-dimensional simplex look like, okay? with uh, different uh, you know, values of the alpha. Alpha are known as the hyperparameters. And also the expectation of those uh, random vectors you know, are actually uh, equivalent to you know, a number defined by the hyperparameters alpha. You can see it's the, the mean vector, the normalized vector of alpha. Okay? So that's a very, very kind of explicit and simple expression of Dirichlet. And uh, the alpha actually has some interesting effect, as you will see in a second. You can already see with different uh, values of alpha, you know, uh, you can see the, the, the color, you know, the, uh, the heat map is changing, you know, from here to here. The heat map here is uh, more kind of a uniform, and the heat map in here are becoming more and more divergent, okay? Where the mass basically are concentrated more and more on the corners, okay? All right. And uh, Dirichlet defines a conjugate prior, as I just claimed. And what does it mean? It means that uh, once you observe the data, ID data, sampled from the parameters theta, which are sampled also from the Dirichlet prior, then you can define a posterior of the pi, which is, again, pi is the parameter used to uh, parameterize the multinomial distribution. Now your posterior becomes uh, look like this. Okay, this part is, uh, you know, the prior, which is a Dirichlet. And this is the likelihood, okay, you know, uh, of, uh, in fact, uh, the order is like this part correspond to this, and this part correspond to that. Uh, you can see the, the likelihood, you know, uh, look very similar, you know, under multinomial look very similar to what uh, the prior look like, especially on the way how, you know, the 
high parameters, you know, are, are impacted. Okay, and uh, with some arrangements, you can actually write it uh, more clean, which is that uh, now the po in the posterior the pi is now raised to the power of uh, alpha plus the number of uh, counts belonging to the k cluster and minus one. Uh, in fact, the minus one is originally in the Dirichlet Dirichlet prior. And therefore, this whole thing is still a Dirichlet with uh, a uh, augmented parameter. You know, the, the augmentations are contributed from the counts of the of the of the real data, okay, sampled from uh, this uh, multi-mode distribution. And that's why the posterior and the prior are symbolically the same. They both you know, uh, take the same parametric form. That's why it is called conjugate. Okay. Um, so what's the actual kind of effect of having a Dirichlet? Right. You can see that now Dirichlet defines a distribution of the theta, which are the weights, you know, used for a mixture model. So the mixture model itself is a distribution and uh, your Dirichlet is defined a distribution over the theta. Therefore, it is a distribution over the distributions, right? When you sample, you know, uh, a uh, weight vector from the Dirichlet, uh, you can use each of these weight factor to define a uh, Gaussian mixture model by accordingly draw samples of uh, the mu and the, the sigma, you know, for each of the pi vector or the multinomial vector. And then the Dirichlet division is going to help you define, you know, another layer of distribution over all these mixtures. Okay, so therefore you have a distribution of the mixture model. And this is basically our beginning concept of a distribution of distributions. And uh, let's say, you know, how this uh, really look like. Let's uh, assume that uh, these Gaussian mixtures are following a uh, trivial covariance matrix the identity, just for the sake of a simple argument but the mean still is a random variable. Then you can draw the means, you know, from, uh, you know, this uh, Gaussian distribution, right? And then you can draw the weights. So here we have the means, and here we have the weights coming from a Dirichlet. And then the Dirich prior basically allows you to, as I said, define a probability distribution over parameters, right? And the, how they look like, it's like you are providing this uh, random weight vector, okay? And then you can have uh, multiple different uh, samples of this uh, random vector. And uh, then each of them, you know, uh, can, you know, uh, correspond to, you know, uh, a location inside, you know, this uh, Gaussian distribution where the mu are drawn from, okay? And in a second, I will tell you, sometimes the statisticians are called them the atoms and also, you know, the positions. Okay, so this is uh, the weight of an atom. And here, almost you can see it's a position under, you know, uh, you know a Gaussian distribution. And uh, the actual position is determined by, you know, the value you draw from the Gaussian distribution. And they together, the position and the atom defines you know, a mixture model. And the, the Dirichlet prior defines the distribution over that. Okay. So now it's like, uh, let's see uh, how it look like. In fact, before I move on to extrapolate and extend the Dirichlet distribution into a more flexible non-parametric basin setting, let's see some nice properties of uh, the Dirichlet distribution. Okay, just very quickly go through that. One property is called a collapsing property. It means that, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, in fact, the math goes like if you have a random value coming from gamma, then you can basically, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, prove that uh, a vector of uh, such gamma distributed random variables actually follows a Dirichlet distribution whose parameters are defined by the numbers which were used to define every one-dimensional gamma distribution. Okay, and if you have uh, two gammas gamma variables, then their sum actually also is a gamma distribution, follows a gamma distribution whose parameters are determined by the sum of uh, the hyperparameters, okay, of the original distribution, okay. 
Okay, so this is just uh, algebraic properties that can easily, easily prove. And the same spirit carries to the Dirichlet. If you have a k-dimensional Dirichlet vector following a distribution parameterized by the k-dimensional alpha vector, then you can collapse you know, this k-dimensional Dirichlet vector a random variable into a k minus one dimensional by just uh, maybe combine the first two dimensional together. And they actually also follow a Dirichlet of which, you know, the first uh, two hyperparameters can be also collapsed to define now the first dimension of the new Dirichlet. So, so it's, a, it's called a collapsing property because you can see the easy correspondence between this and this and that and that, okay. You collapse the sum, the random variable, and then that also corresponds to a collapsing of the hyperparameters in the prior distribution. There is a reverse operation called the splitting, okay, and uh, that can be, uh, you know, approved, you know, from uh, how a beta distribution is evolved. Now it's uh, behaving. For example, if you have, uh, you know, a random variable that was uh, drawn from uh, the beta, you know, uh, parameterized by a alpha one, split it by the b. Okay, b for example is a uh, uh, a uh, number between zero and one. You can imagine that uh, they cut the a into a b proportion and the one minus b proportion. So basically, this is how we split the beta and define a distribution of alpha of theta. Then you can use the theta, which is a random variable, to split a particular dimension inside the Dirichlet. Say, let's split the, R, the pi one using theta, okay? By, you know, uh, multiplying R for one, or pi one with theta, and the pi one with some one minus theta. And then this new random vector, which is uh, one more, which is a one, dimension more than the original, you know, k dimension, it's not k plus one dimensional vector. They actually follow a Dirichlet distribution, which is also k one dimensional. And the first, uh, you know, uh, uh, alpha parameter gets also split by B in the same way that the beta was split, okay? So you can see this very interesting correspondence of uh, the split of uh, the random variable and also the split of the hyperparameters. There is one-to-one -one correspondence in here. Okay. And likewise, if uh, you can, if uh, you uh, use uh, not a binary split, but a multi-way split, you have the same effect. For example, let's draw now a theta, not from, not from beta, but from a Dirichlet, which is uh, say uh, n dimension, okay? Then you can use this uh, n dimensional theta to split one of the dimensions inside the Dirichlet into n by multiplying them all with, uh, you know, this uh, theta. And then you basically can split the Dirichlet distribution into, again, k plus one, n minus one dimension, okay, whose uh, hyperparameters are determined by the B splitter that is originally splitting the, the Dirichlet hyperparameters. So just remember this two trick, collapsing and splitting can be done easily. So what does that mean? It actually gives you a hint that uh, when you are trying to, you know, uh, add one dimension or remove one dimension from a, uh, uh, a uh, prior distribution of the parameters, you know, you have a way to build connections between the pre-integration or pre-split versus the post-integration and the post-integrate. Okay. All right, uh, there are some other properties which I'm going to uh, just uh, let go. Uh, for example, here, you know, uh, if uh, you have a random vector which follows a Dirichlet, then what is the distribution of uh, the renormalized random vector with uh, one less dimension? Well, they ag again follows the same Dirichlet with uh, one of the dimension removed. So these are all very intuitive, uh, you know, algebraic properties. Okay. Now uh, let's go back to uh, choosing number of clusters again, right? Choosing number of clusters, 
you know, uh, when it affects, you know, the, uh, the hyperparameters, you know, correspond to changing dimensions of the pipe, the weights, right? So this one basically, you know, has the same dimension of the pipe. If you change the K, then the pipe dimension will be changing. So how to actually achieve this changing? So now we see, uh, you know, uh, the, the overall bigger picture. We just talk about the parametric model where you pre-select a K. And you can try many Ks, use, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, some loss-driven, you know, uh, evaluation, BIC, or some other loss. Then there is also a, a non-parametric mass approach where you just uh, uh, avoid setting any number of k. You just let the number of parameters to grow with the data. If you remember, we have uh, uh, in classical statistics, you know, a technique known as the you know a kernel density estimator, where the probability you know of uh, uh, the distribution of uh, a random variable can be actually defined by a kernel function. Right, by theta, maybe here we have i equals to n and so basically you need to have n such kind of uh, kernels, each defined on, you know, a, a particular, you know, uh, training data points to define, again, the probability of uh, a new data point x star. Right, so this is almost like uh, we have all this data and we set basically the Gaussian bound on top of that and you sum all of that. So this is called non-parametric model. The Bayesian non-parametric model is uh, somewhere in between, okay? It is uh, not necessarily defined such a bump on each data point. It may be defining a uh, distribution over some data points, multiple, could be one, could be multiple. But you still technically allow infinitely many such things if you have infinite data. So we don't set the k a priori, okay? We allow infinite number of clusters of parameters a priori, but because your data are finite, therefore only a finite kind of number of parameters will be actually used. And the, the rest of parameters, we don't say they don't exist. They were marginalized out you know, using you know, a, a Bayesian approach. Okay, so this is basically the mentality or the spirit underlying the Bayesian number metrics. And let's see how actually it work. Okay. So, um, So what, what could be the, the, the right prior here to define what we know as the infinite dimensional, you know, uh, you know, weights right here. Again, we have infinity. How does this uh, Dirichlet prior look like? Dirichlet is not the right prior for this purpose because it is finite dimension. But can we actually play some trick and then make it behave like the infinite dimension? So here, let's see how that can, achieve, can be achieved. Okay, so let's start from uh, maybe a two-dimensional Dirichlet random vector. Okay, draw from uh, a two-dimensional Dirichlet prior. Okay, and remember that uh, we can split, you know, uh, the uh, the existing Dirichlet prior using a pivot. Okay, draw from a beta. Okay, let's say we draw such a pivot. Okay, draw two of them. Okay. And then the first one will be pivoting the pi one, the second one will be pivoting the theta two, or the, the pi two, and then it leads to a four-dimensional pi. Okay, the four-dimensional multinomial random variable following a Dirichlet that is also four-dimensional. So we know how to do it already from the previous example. And uh, now let's imagine that we just do this uh, on and on repeatedly, repetitively. Then you can imagine that uh, we can have uh, a uh, k-dimensional multinomial vector whose uh, you know, uh, distribution can follow a Dirichlet whose uh, hyperparameters are simply defined by alpha divided by this capital K. And we can also set K into infinity. Then we basically can get uh, you know, an a, a, a infinite dimensional vector, actually conceptually at least. So this is basically, you know, uh, leading to a distribution 
which is no longer called a Dirichlet uh, distribution. It is called a Dirichlet process. It's the infinite limit okay, of a Dirichlet distribution, which allows you to you know, conceptually draw a infinite dimensional weight functions. Okay. Okay, and then once you imagine, suppose you have these uh, weight functions already, okay, which is uh, one to infinity, then, you know, each of this dimension needs to have its own, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, cluster centers and cluster covariance, which we call theta, right? And they can be drawn from uh, another distribution, H, which we will call them be calling them base measure in a second. And then you can imagine this whole thing jointly defines a distribution, okay, which is uh, infinite dimension, right? So basically each one will be weighted by the theta at the pi k. And then, you know, this is a delta function. The delta function will be, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, realized to one when you hit a real number that is equivalent to theta k and otherwise it is zero. Therefore, you are effectually selecting whether this uh, pi k is uh, realized in the cluster problem or not. Okay. So this is basically an infinite distribution over the space defined by h. Okay. And uh, we call this a Dirichlet process that is uh, jointly parameterized by the hyperparameter alpha, which is also known as the concentration parameter because uh, it is defining, you know, the behavior, how spread and uh, how uh, concentrated this uh, pi parameter can look like. And then the H is uh, almost like a inventory, okay, of all these uh, atom positions that you can draw the theta from. Okay. So let's look at uh, maybe a graphical illustration of that. Okay. We sample, uh, by the way, you know, there is a huge differences between sampling, say, you know, uh, you know, uh, a uh, draw a example from a H versus a draw example from a Dirichlet process. There is a, a huge differences. Okay. H defines a uh, continuous distribution over the theta, like this Gaussian distribution. Okay. You can basically draw any you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a uh, position, you know, from this distribu uh, continuous distribution. But uh, Dirichlet actually defines a discrete distribution over the same space of theta, okay? Because uh, you basically, once you draw it, it's going to be assigned with a weight, okay? And, uh, and uh, then it will be put into, you know, uh, the support of the Dirichlet pr process. And next time, you may be able to redraw it with a non-zero probability, as we will see in a second. That's actually the very important, uh, you know, uh, properties, you know, of uh, of uh, of Dirich process versus uh, H, say, a Gaussian distribution. So here, let's again look at uh, uh, other properties. So first of all, Dirich process are discrete, okay, and uh, how they look like? They look like this. It consists of uh, you know a pi which is uh, infinite dimensional and uh, these heights of the spikes are the value of uh, each dimension inside the pi and uh, there are infinite many of them okay potentially and these are known as uh, you know a uh, atom because they each have a point mass defined by the value of the pi pi k okay. and then they also have a position in here, which is uh, a location, which is uh, defined by, you know, uh, you know, uh, the value that you draw from H. H in here is, is known as a base measure. Okay. So basically, you know, you, you put in here. These are the mu, basically, mu k, for example, corresponding to the pi k. Okay. So if you look at this uh, whole thing, versus uh, just a Gaussian distribution, you can see the differences, right? This collection now, with both the position and also, you know, the, the point mass defines 
you know, a discrete distribution over real numbers. But in here, a Gaussian defines a continuous distribution over real numbers. Now, what's the key kind of uh, consequence of these uh, two things, dp versus h? Now, I ask, if you want to draw a new sample conditioning on all your existing examples of the samples, let's say, you know, I'm going to draw a new theta conditioning on all the theta I have so far. When you draw it from H, what's the probability of uh, uh, having a new theta that is uh, equal to the old ones? Someone can answer me. Zero. Great. Thank you very much, John. Now, if I draw the theta from uh, the dish process, you know, which is uh, graphically illustrated in here, okay, what's the probability of uh, having uh, repeating or redrawing a previously appeared theta value? Do you have a hunch? Remember, this is discrete, not continuous. Maybe I should make the e question easier. Do you think the probability of repeating an older example zero or non zero? Not zero. Okay, I've, I've, I've got two answers saying that. Great, thank you very much. And do you have kind of a rough guess about uh, you know, uh, what that probability may correspond to? Now you'll see the graph here. Right, so there's a graph here. Every atom has a point mass associated with that. All right, yeah, I bet you probably uh, have some sense, but maybe you don't know how to express it. It is going to be proportional to the magnitude of the mass, right? For example, an atom here, which has a lot of mass, may have a greater chance of being resampled. And I'm going to show you why that's the case. You will see very, very quickly that is actually the effect. And of course, there is possibility of drawing something also new from the Gaussian, which you never see before. There's also a number, a, a kind of a magnitude corresponding to that effect. Okay. So let's first see uh, how sample from Dirichlet process look like as a function of uh, the hyperparameters. One of the hyperparameters is known as uh, the the, the scale parameters or concentration parameters, alpha. And you can see alpha equals to 0.1, equals to 1, and equals to 10, give you very, very different look of uh, the resultant pi vector. So this vector looks like a, just a one dimensional, but it's not. In fact, if you look at it carefully here, there are all these uh, little tiny pi's, which are barely visible compared to this uh, towering one pi k that is a very very big close to one in fact the whole thing sum to one because these are after all a multinomial variable right multinomial vector therefore a multinomial uh, uh, you know a parameter vector therefore they should sum to one they are all between zero and one right so one being very close to one that all others are very close to zero but they are not zero right so it is sparse it's concentrated on a few dimensions when you get a bigger alpha, the mass gets spread across more dimensions. When you have an even bigger alpha, the spread gets more. So that's basically how you use the alpha to control down the road you can see. How do you like to see new clusters to be occupied? A priori. Okay, so because remember this is a prior, therefore it defines a, a priori weight of every dimension or every cluster. And here there's a huge concentration. And here, there is a good spread. Okay. And uh, there are some more properties, you know, of uh, you know the Dirichlet process. What we are getting from the Dirichlet process is essentially a partition of uh, some, you know, parameter space, okay, or maybe the real space, because uh, now the original Gaussian, which is continuous, are reducing to atoms in this Gaussian and each atom gets a weight, right? Therefore, you are essentially partitioning this real space into, you know, uh, chunks. Like in here, for example, this real space, real line 
becomes a, a chunk like this. And each of them is basically weighted, you know, by, you know, uh, uh, this uh, uh, height of uh, the uh, Dirichlet random variable. Okay. And again, you can have uh, different samples of the Dirichlet random variable. Therefore, they give you different uh, partitions, right? And uh, it turns out that if you multiply, you know, uh, you know, the mass, you know, of, uh, you know, a particular atom under the original base measure times the steel parameter. And then you basically form a vector, you know, of uh, all the atoms in this way. Okay. And uh, use them to define a Dirich distribution. And then it turns out that your mass associated with each of these apartheid is following a Dirich distribution. It's a finite Dirich distribution parameterized by this. Okay, well, that's why that's how you see the scale parameter, the concentration parameter, and also the base measure impacts, you know, the partition, you know, of uh, you know uh, the random partition of uh, the real space. Okay, so that's actually a, uh, you know, it's known as the finite marginal because after all you have the real, uh, you have a finite number of examples and these examples, you know, will be clustered into a finite number of clusters. And that's basically how the weights of the cluster will be distributed, you know, under a Dirichlet process. Okay. And it can be infinite because Dirichlet process itself is infinite dimensional. You can keep adding clusters. Right. But once you, you know, uh, finished taking care of all given data points, it still becomes finite. And then this is how the mass are distributed as a Dirich process. And this is a, a paper of a, 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 a property established by Ferguson in his very famous 1973 paper. And Dirich process like Dirich distribution is conjugate. It is very, very similar to a Dirich distribution. Okay. You can show that uh, if uh, you know you you know uh, use uh, a uh, Dirichlet uh, process to define a prior of the pi, and then you draw one sample, you know from uh, you know this distribution, and as a result, you know attribute this sample to one of the you know uh, say k clusters. Let's say it attribute to here, then the posterior of uh, the distribution of the distribution or the distribution of the cluster, given this sample under a Dirichlet process prior, it's still a Dirichlet process whose uh, concentration parameters are changed by one count, one count and also whose uh, uh, base measure are rescaled, okay, by alpha, you know, over alpha plus one. Okay, so it's a rescaled process in the posterior. Okay. So this is basically how a Dirichlet process look like. It allows you to really, you know, uh, keep, you know, splitting the space, okay, into arbitrary K. And then once, uh, you know, you have a uh, real data, uh, they then define basically a, uh, you know, a uh, finite dimensional measure. Uh, that is uh, defined, you know, following a Dirichlet distribution of finite dimensional whose parameters are defined by the concentration and the base measure. And then, you know, if you see more data, then you can have a, a posterior of the Dirichlet process that is also a Dirichlet process. So what I've said so far is uh, conceptually kind of, uh, uh, you know, maybe convenient to describe and, and, and concise. But operationally, it may be a little bit difficult. For example, how can you uh, write down the predictive distribution, you know, of uh, in a, a new sample? Okay. So the what uh, you know, uh, um, practically, it is uh, look like this. You need to first have a pi coming from a dp and a theta, a pi and a theta together coming from dp of uh, alpha and the uh, h, right? So pi is basically, you know, a infinite dimensional 
and uh, theta is a collection of uh, of uh, you know theta uh, of a mu and a sigma, right? And uh, maybe a part of that interdimensional is not finite because uh, up to k, for example, they are occupied by data points, and the rest are not occupied. Therefore, we don't explicitly write it down. And then when you are drawing a new example, you basically need to uh, first draw a z star from the pi to determine which cluster, which uh, cluster it is belonging to. Maybe it is uh, one of the, you know, uh, one to k existing one, or maybe it is uh, the one that hasn't appeared in this infinite set. Then depending on that, you will be drawing x either from uh, a theta k, or you draw a new theta from the base, and then you draw a star from a new theta. Okay. So this is rather cumbersome kind of process of uh, drawing in a, a new sample theta, okay, x. So what we're going to uh, continue is uh, a uh, more convenient way of doing that, because we're doing really Bayesian you know, uh, approach where, you know, the original, you know, theta, you know, uh, x star from uh, theta, where the theta is uh, coming from a posterior of theta given x, and then this is the x, old x, one to n. This is basically our Bayesian approach, right? We can actually change it by margin, marginalize, integrating this out and uh, make this a function dependent on x1 and n only and also hyperparameters and h. Okay. This is actually a exercise we're going to do down the road. Integrating out, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the hyperparameter, uh, the uh, the prior distribution. This is the prior, and the po this is the posterior. Okay, and then determining the predicted distribution of the new data point directly from all the data you have, and also the prior distribution. Okay, are we on the same page? I see a uh, question here. Why are the things in the figure over a subset, and not for a single atom? Ah, okay, good point. Um, it could be over a single atom, by the way. Okay. Uh, if you remember, every new atom, you know, when they draw, you need to determine, you know, uh, you know, uh, what what location it is, right? And uh, it can because we are drawing the atom from a Dirichlet process. Therefore, you know, the locations can be repeated or can be new, okay? And for the repeated ones, we actually are collapsing them to look at their cumulative weights. But for the single ones, they still can have a single you know, atom. Okay, thanks, okay, great. All right, let's look at this uh, predicted distribution, uh, starting from one, okay? So a priori, you know, we have uh, nothing, and therefore, we're going to draw, you know, uh, a two-dimensional, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, weight vector. Why two-dimensional? Because uh, you need to pick one dimension, and then you need to have another dimension for the rest of the unused clusters, right? And uh, we're going to basically use uh, this uh, direction prior. And uh, now you have it. We're going to draw the second one. I said we're going to use a marginalized approach where the you know, the, the, the posterior will be marginalized out, okay? So this is the posterior, given the first data point already, okay? And we can integrate out all the, you know, uh, parameters from the previous, you know, uh, you know uh, exam uh, from the determined by the previous example, okay? And then after doing some algebraic uh, kind of uh, 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 you know, manipulation, you actually will see that uh, you know, this is a predicted distribution of the second example, given the first example, and also the prior happens to have this breakdown, okay? It is going to choose the previous cluster 
with probability one over one plus alpha, and otherwise for a new cluster with uh, one and alpha. Okay. In fact, you can also now add uh, you know another data point, okay, after the first two and the conditioning on the first and the second. It turns out that uh, you could uh, have uh, three options, okay, for the choice of uh, the you know atom you know, uh, given the first two atoms already. In fact, that answers uh, your uh, question about uh, why, you know, uh, you know uh, sometimes the atom can have uh, more than one count. Well, you can see the third atom will have uh, these uh, three options of uh, picking their values. They can choose the, the location of the first atom. They can choose the location of the second atom. They can also choose a new location with all that. So just do this, you probably can see that at the end of the day, if you are having n data points already, and they are you know, uh, picking locations with uh, these you know, counts okay, in the existing data points, you know, basically the M's loca MK's location gets uh, MK counts, then your N plus one atom will be picking the locations using this formula. It is going to pick an existing location with probability proportional to the counts already for that atom. Okay, in here. And also with uh, a probability proportional to alpha over n plus alpha for a new location or new cluster. Cluster basically is corresponding to a location determined by the mean, right? So this has this very nice property called rich catch richer. You can imagine some locations or some clusters with some more counts already will have a more probability to be repicked. But on the other hand, you still have, uh, you know, uh, the prob non-zero probability of being original, okay? So these are known as the non-parametric kind of approach. You have the potential to go infinity in here, but you are also having a tendency to reinforce the existing clusters. Okay, and in here, we never directly pre-select the number of k's. Okay, the k is an ongoing process. We will add if necessary, but we don't pre-select it. And also we don't set the k to be as many as the number of examples because uh, this uh, concentration effect will lead to collapsing okay, of collisions. Okay, so this is basically, you know, an important equation, which uh, is known as the predictive distribution, you know, of, uh, you know, the uh, new samples under a Dirichlet process. Okay, this is not a Dirichlet distribution, it's called a Dirichlet process distribution. And also in here, we are not explicitly defining the Dirichlet process, you know, uh, for, you know, the alpha. We integrate them out already. Okay, here this process is a posterior, you know, depending on the prior and also the sample. We integrate them out. We only now are defining a predictive distribution of the new data points given all the old data points. And this is very important. Okay, that's a popular way, in fact, of uh, describing a Dirich process without the Dirich process itself being explicitly written down. This process was, uh, in fact, uh, uh, presented in uh, a number of different uh, metaphors, just for your knowledge. They may be helping you to uh, remember, you know, how this uh, mechanism is working. One of the metaphors is known as uh, the Hoya-Urn process. And uh, this is a, a cool picture showing you how the Hoya-Urn process looks like. It's like a, you, you know, uh, want to add to the urn, you know, uh, infinite number of balls with uh, different colors, okay? And uh, at the end of the day, you want to get a sense about uh, after I, you know, uh, put uh, n balls here, how the color distribution look like, okay? And uh, the Dirich process prior is basically a uh, prior distribution over the colors, okay? The colors could correspond to locations under a Gaussian base measure or, you know, cluster central, as you can imagine. It's just a, a way to distinct different atoms, a priori, right? And uh, the joint of uh, 
you know, all the filled in ERMs after your sample N, you know, balls is known as a Dirich process. And then the Poi ERM process is actually, you know, a kind of a, a, a procedure that defines you, you know, how to, you know, you know, uh, you know, draw color, you know, for every new ball given the previous one, given, you know, the, the I minus this new one. And here is a written formula for that. Okay. In fact, it's written here, but I'm not going to read from the slides. It's kind of boring to read from here. Let's go back to the previous one. What you do is that, uh, first of all, imagine the urn is empty. Okay. It has nothing in here. And then it's a black ball, basically. You know, imagine that it's an imaginary black ball, which, uh, you know, you will be drawing. Okay. And this black ball has a mass of alpha. Okay. So um, in your in the draw of, you know, of number one to all the you know, big N, you repeat the following process. The black ball is where you begin with, which is already in the urn. You draw a ball from the urn. Put your hand into the urn and uh, pick out one. The first one, of course, it has to be black ball because you, you, you only have that one in there. Right? And uh, therefore, you know, with uh, probability alpha, you, know, uh, you are going to now sample, you know, uh, you know, uh, a new color from uh, this uh, base prior, from the base measure, G, okay? And then you put this ball back to the urn. Okay, now the urn has a black ball and also a new color, right? And then for the second one, you begin by drawing a random ball from the urn, which now has black and also a new color. And you are going to now, you know, look at the color, and if it is uh, a new color, you draw the same, you draw another ball with the same color and put it back to the urn. If you see the black, then you draw a new color. Okay, not the same color, you know, and with the probability alpha over, you know, one alpha plus alpha, basically the number of uh, total number of balls in the urn, and then put a new ball with a new color back to the urn. You can imagine that after you have enough balls in the urn, you pretty much will be following this, right? The probability of, uh, you know, uh, drawing a, determining a color of the new ball to put back into the urn will be proportional to the number of balls of each color inside the urn plus a innovation probability of, uh, you know, uh, drawing a new color. This one basically corresponds to that black ball, which is uh, always in the urn, right? So this is known as the Poyang urn process. You can, you can see again, that kind of uh, self-reinforcing property that uh, colors which are better represented are going to be more often used, you know, uh, in collecting the new balls, okay? So that's a process we know to be very, very, uh, you know, to be reported in, uh, in this particular paper. And that basically gives you a way of uh, you know, defining a distribution over potentially infinite number of colors. And you can imagine you can use the color to start, uh, you know, defining downstream applications, like uh, being the cluster centroid of uh, all shaded colors and so forth, right? Okay. The other process, which is uh, also reminiscent of the predictive distribution of a new sample, uh, given the older ones under Dirich process, is a little bit funnier. Uh, it's called the Chinese restaurant process. It was also invented by uh, statisticians who uh, live in a uh, demography where uh, you, they have a lot of Chinese restaurants. Um, so here is uh, how it looked like. Imagine that we have a, a Chinese restaurant with uh, you know infinite number of uh, round tables. Okay, so the first customer came in and uh, he will pick a table, whatever it is. He, says he has to sit in one of his table, call this table one, okay? And then the next customer comes in and uh, he will do the following. He will pick uh, you know, a, a table uh, that is already occupied by some customers with the probability proportional to the number of customers already around the table, okay? For example, here, he will pick a table 
first to proceed with this existing guy. But he may also have a probability of uh, picking a new table. Okay, so these are the two things which will happen. Okay, either sit with a table that is already occupied with probability proportional to the popularity of that table or pick a new table. Okay, and at the end of the day, you can see this is a way to partition all the customers around the tables. And uh, this partition actually uh, has a very nice property. It is that uh, at the end of the day, if you have the n customers, they will be divided on tables. And uh, the way you divide them is actually independent or re irrelevant to the order which customer come in and which customer come next. You can redo the whole thing with a different ordering of the customers. They will still be divided the same thing. That's basically you know, a property known as the exchangeability. Okay? It doesn't depend on the order in which data arrives. And according to Diffinetti's theorem, you know, exchangeability, the, the presence of exchangeability, for example, x1 all the way to xn, if they are exchangeable and the order independent, that actually is an indicator of uh, the existence of a prior distribution over all of that, which uh, de-separates basically all the samples from each other. Okay, so what is this? Well, in our case, this is our solution process. But why in CRP, when you actually, you know, are determining which table, you know, a, a new customer will be going to, conditioning on the previous one. It sounds like it is dependent, right? And the reason is because uh, this one, once it is marginalized out, then this uh, new data point xi will be dependent on everything in here. If the common kind of uh, prior distribution is integrated out. But when it is a given, then all these will be independent of each other. Therefore, the way they are assigning the label you know, as a whole, when you look at the distribution of the, of the you know, grouping, they become exchangeable and dependent, independent of the ordering. Okay, so this is what exchangeability means. And that's actually also important for uh, the dish process to be a proper prior, you know, for grouping data points. Okay, uh, I want to close by another, uh, close this part, not a whole lecture, by yet another, uh, process that defines a Dirich process. And I've already talked about the pile urn and a Chinese search process. I'm going to end with a, a third one, which is known as the stick breaking process. Stick process actually goes back to closer to uh, our original, uh, you know, way of uh, splitting, you know, a uh, Dirich uh, uh, distributed uh, random vectors and uh, attributes uh, positions to the atoms. So here is uh, how it look like. Imagine I have a stick, okay, this one of a unit length one, and I have a base measure which is a Gaussian. It's like my inventory of uh, samples. Okay, the stick break breaking process says the following: I'm going to use uh, a uh, beta random variable, okay, to uh, to define a pivot, okay? And uh, this uh, beta random variable draw comes from a beta distribution, okay? If it comes from a, a beta distribution. It's a one-dimensional number, a scalar between zero and one. That's uh, the property of a beta random variable. I'm going to it to pivot into the unit uh, kind of a stick and uh, I'm going to basically, you know, uh, define, use it to define, you know, uh, a uh, value for the pi, which is our weight, okay? So now my first beta leads to such a pivot or such a split, and then I take the upper part, okay, into my pi. Now I need to get uh, a second uh, split. I'm going to draw a beta again in here, Okay, and I'm going to use that to pick with the remaining, okay, of the stick in here. 
the remaining part is computed by this equation, okay? Which is not only 0.6 because of the first 0.4 was taken already. 0.6 times 0.5 leads to 0.3. This part will become my, so this is pi one, this is now pi two, okay? And, uh, and also, oh, I forgot, when I get pi one, I'm going to also use, uh, you know, this base measure to sample a location of the pi one. Therefore, you have a combination of pi one and also theta one, okay? And uh, for pi two, you imagine I'm going to, you know, use uh, that base measure again to sample another location, which is now theta two. I'm going to then do the third, which uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, break stick, break, uh, break the stick a, a third time using the third uh, beta random variable. This time I get an eight. It's bigger than the previous two, but uh, what's remain in the stick is smaller. Therefore, I may still get a small value. You can still be bigger than the previous one. That's possible if you get an extremely large, you know, uh, you know, uh, say uh, a beta. But uh, there's a tendency of getting smaller and smaller shares. Okay. And then you get a third atom and so forth and fourth. So this state breaking is also defining an infinite dimensional pi vector. But now it's ordered, okay, in a sense from bigger to small. And at the end, you can imagine that you will be getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, pies, right? And uh, that actually inspires you know, some operation of a truncating and uh, just uh, you know, uh, approximate the Dirichlet process with a proper you know, Dirichlet distribution. Okay. It turns out that this process, known as the stick breaking process, defines a distribution, which is now obviously equal to this one, you know, pi, which is the mass of that stick, and uh, times you know, the location of uh, these uh, samples, these atoms, and one can prove that this whole thing is also a Dirichlet process, okay? And all your pi was sum to one, and these are where you get the pivots and also uh, the locations, okay? So this is our third constructive way of defining the Dirichlet process. You can see it's very different from the, the, uh, the uh, predictive distribution from the Poirier and the CRP, but they all lead to the same partition, okay, of, uh, you know, this sample space. And also the same kind of uh, distribution over all these atoms and locations. Okay, so uh, uh, because of the interest of time, I'm going to go a little bit uh, faster. I see no questions in here. You can see, you know, now we are ended with, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, two very different ways of defining the same distribution, which is a Dirich process. And uh, even the graphical models for these two can be a little bit different, right? So this is a pile of R where you focus on the samples and there are N of them. And they come from a uh, Dirich related distribution, a Dirich process, this is a DP, right? With a prior and with uh, you know, base measure and with uh, the, the concentration. And uh, remember DP is a discrete, Therefore, for this uh, n theta, some of the theta will pick the same value. Some are having, you know, uh, you know, individual values, okay. And uh, their partition is uh, following a finite dimensional Dirichlet, okay? but they have infinite potentials of, uh, you know, of accommodating an infinite number of data points. The stick breaking process, basically, in here in the Poirot urn, the clustering is. Uh, kind of uh, emerging, you know, uh, and uh, changing, you know, when you get more and more samples. And there is this self-reinforcing property that you can imagine, that you can, you can, you can get. In the stick breaking process, it's more like a preset, you know. You actually are clustering data, and uh, each data actually have an indicator Y, okay, so that they indicate which value they choose. And this indicator follows a prior distribution, pi, which actually is determined by that stick breaking process. You stick break the stick from a unit stick and then break them into weights that are between zero and one. And then here, my base measure is a uh, 
micro or a database of uh, all the date sample locations, atom locations. Okay. So this one, this one actually are equivalent. Okay. They look the different, but they are actually the, the equivalent. They define the same partition of uh, the samples and the same distribution over the sample label in terms of the color. Sometimes this is more explicit in terms of uh, drawing connections to the clustering approach we used before for k-means and of Gaussian. Okay. But this one is making it easier for you to draw samples from. Okay, so uh, with that, let's see what I have. Uh, inference, or well, I don't have time to talk about inference too much, but you can pretty much imagine that uh, this is a key equation uh, using the PLR and the CRP process to assign labels of every new sample point. And you will, because it's order independent, therefore you can, you know, re-scramble the sample, condition every sample on any other data sample without hurting or influencing the eventual way of data being clustered. Therefore, you can repeatedly sample until the distribution converges. That's the beauty of that. It's not like you do one pass of the data and you have to basically stick to that. You can do as many parts as possible on, of the same data set and converge to, you know, a eventual invariant partition. Okay. And this is how you sample. You are going to really just use a very simple formula, depends on all the previous data points, all the existing cluster centroids, and uh, then label the new data points that you are going to give them the label from. And there are, again, two options. One is to attribute to existing uh, data points, and this is a new data points. This f function is uh, like the mixture Gaussian components. It is defining the likelihood function of the new data points given you know, the parameters of uh, the previous data points uh, of the existing clusters. And this is uh, you know, a new cluster draw from the base measure. Again, typically people integrate them out and therefore we can, again, define a marginal probability of, uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, the new data points which we labeled n under the prior distribution and under the base measure. Okay. There are some difficulties in mixing and so forth, uh, which, uh, uh, which is written on the slides, which I'm going, not going to present now, but you can take a look after time, afterwards. Um, with the time remaining, I'm going to quickly look, uh, talk about a, uh, a extrapolation of this technique using uh, a topic model as uh, a, a, a motivating example. And uh, why this uh, discreteness of uh, the distribution can actually be very useful, you know, uh, to, uh, to uh, sample, uh, to, to, to model, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, arbitrary type of data, okay. So, this is a slide describing a recap as what is a topic model. I'm not going to uh, read the slides. You, you should go back and, and review that. And this is a graphic model of topic models. And you can see there are, you know, topic specific beta, which is the topic vector. That's the frequency of the words, right? Under each topic, say sports and politics. And then there is another multinomial or uh, uh, you know, random variable, uh, which is the, the breakdown of uh, topic weights for every document, okay? And uh, this is a very popular model, but uh, unfortunately you need to set up the K so that uh, you need to predetermine the number of topics. And uh, what if you don't know the number of topics and uh, your uh, number of documents keep coming so that you want to allow new topics to be picked up, okay? Well, with uh, our Dirichlet process technique, you may imagine that uh, there is a way to define a infinite topic model and let the data to decide how many number of topics that you need to do. So one thing, of course, is very easy. You can just take this whole thing and uh, make it uh, a Dirichlet process, which now make it uh, infinite. And this is infinite, this is infinite. But um, the infinite topic model uh, in this way uh, is uh, becoming a little bit awkward because uh, when the next, uh, you, know, uh, you know, document comes in, it is uh, very, very likely, you know, to uh, 
depart from the previous topic used because it's infinite. Therefore, I always have a strong properties of uh, you know uh, not using the old topic and uh, keep sampling new topics. Right. So that's basically a a, a problem that uh, basically it it doesn't get a encouragement of uh, sharing the documents. Okay. If uh, we just directly replace the Dirichlet with a Dirichlet process. And how to encourage stronger sharing among the topics? So here is, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a idea. Basically, you know, a, we are going to be having, let's say in here, a pool of topics. And uh, if you have a, uh, a document which come and uh, directly, you know, pick, you know, say finite number of topics, you know, uh, from here. And I have many, many uh, D, two, D, three, and so forth. And each of them is defined by a infinite topic model. Then you know, there is, uh, you know, a, uh, at least, at least less tendency for these uh, two documents, you know, to really pick up same topics. It's very, very difficult. It's not impossible, it's very difficult. What if we do the following, you know, we still say that uh, each of them is uh, following, you know, a uh, duration process prior. Okay. Imagine these are two Dirich process prior. And uh, if uh, their items are just independently drawn, you can imagine that their overlap will be very small. But what if uh, on top of this, we again have uh, you know, a set of uh, topics which are infinite, from which these actually are drawn from. Okay, so that's basically the idea. It's basically, you know, another layer of uh, inventories, which is shared among all these uh, secondary inventories of topics. So if I want to do this, this is already a DP, then what this should look like? Anybody can suggest? So I have documents which is following a Dirich process that is infinite topic. And now I want uh, all this, uh, you know, n different uh, infinite topic uh, distributions to have some way to share their atoms. Then where does these atoms should come from? Any suggestions? Originally, these atoms will come from uh, some base measure, uh, which is uh, continuous. Let's say, you know, uh, just uh, a Gaussian vector of uh, the topic frequency, or maybe a, a duration vector of topic frequency as of us. And therefore, when I draw from use uh, in here, and when I draw in here, you know, because we are drawing the topic items from uh, a, a continuous, they don't have to overlap. What if uh, I want them to overlap? Then where should I draw from? No answer? Okay. Um, I'll tell you that this one can also be a DP. Okay. So I'm going to define a prior which contain atoms of uh, topics which are discrete atoms. Therefore, when I start to draw topics in here, I'm not going to draw topics, you know, for every document from a continuous prior distribution, but also from a discrete prior distribution, which is a DP, okay? And that allows the two DPs in here and DPs in here to have uh, shared atoms rather than very independent items, okay? Okay, so this is a graph. 
that looks like, right? So once uh, I have a base measure, which is uh, by itself discrete, then samples from this uh, base measure, which is again, you know, a infinite dimensional Dirich process, even that infinite dimensional, they still have a tendency of uh, have shared atoms. And that's how a topic gets shared. Okay, even by two documents. So this distribution is known as the hierarchical Dirichlet process. Okay, and uh, there is uh, you know a, a nice uh, you know uh, you know a metaphor uh, called the Chinese restaurant franchise. You know which basically you know uh, allows you know uh, the 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 you know a predictive distribution of uh, new customers. You know walking into different restaurants to share the same plate, even if they are in different restaurants. Okay, so the idea is like, uh, when you walk into a restaurant, okay, you need to now uh, sit uh, in the, to the popular table, and then you will be ordering your dishes accordingly, right? Now, the way you order dishes is uh, to look at uh, how popular that dish is in this restaurant, and, uh, and uh, your order. And uh, you have the novelty parameter uh, to order a new dish within this restaurant. But uh, how do you ensure that uh, the other restaurant is uh, uh, potentially sharing their orders with you so that novelty is not going to create a kind of a menu that is uh, making the restaurant all totally different from each other. Okay. So the idea is that uh, you are going to now, if you choose to order a inventory a new dish, you go to the franchise level distribution of the dishes and then look at how the dishes are popular over the entire franchise. And then you pick from there, you know, a new dish and then you add back, you know, the dish back to the, 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 the menu. So once the dish is in the menu of the franchise, then other restaurants could reuse it when their clients or customers are ordering a new dish. So that's the kind of idea. I'm not going to say it is very specific, but you can kind of see the description in here to see how you know, uh, reusability across different restaurants can be implemented. Okay. Okay, so uh, this basically, you know, again, I want to end with a graphic model illustration of that. So we, this is the Dirich process. Uh, original dish process uh, in two illustration, stick breaking and uh, poil urn. The hierarchical dish process is basically to add uh, another layer of uh, dish process on top of, you know, the cluster specific dish process in here, you know, or in here, right? To define a uh, hyper hyper prior, okay, for the children dish process. Okay, and uh, then, you know, uh, that idea can be now used to implement a proper infinite topic model where you can still use an infinite number of topics for the copra, but uh, every document can share in this uh, space of infinite topics, you know, uh, you know uh, and, uh, and reuse topics across different articles. And uh, you can actually plot you know, a posterior distribution uh, reflected in the sample of the number of topics and uh, even pick, you know, ideally in the end, the nice number of, uh, the, the proper number of topics without, you know, trying all possible numbers that uh, you, 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 you need to guess a priori. Okay, I'm way over time already. I want to wrap up. Sorry for the delay. So here is a summary, you know, uh, which uh, walks you through all the materials I cover today. Especially, I want you to read very carefully, you know, my, you know, take home message on what is the dish process and their different form of representation. And also, what is a HDP in terms of uh, their different uh, metaphors. In fact, originally there were two papers, you know, co-developing the hierarchical dish process. I used the topic model one, but there was another one in genetics, which uh, leads you to the same effect. They were actually appeared roughly at the same time, you know, uh, when this technique was just adopted in our machine learning community. 
uh, with that, I want to close here. Uh, any questions from the class? On page 16, should the summation of uh, in the denominator start at 2? Let's uh, walk back to page 16. Let's see. Give me a second. Your question is uh, start at two. Where is? Oh, I see. Let's see. Uh, um, <laughs> nice pick. Thank you. Mm. Yes, you're right. Any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, uh, have a nice day for the rest of the day and I will see you on Wednesday then.